My name is Dan Hahn, um, and today the talk's uh, theme is on change, as you know. And uh, I ask, before we discuss change, we have to decide and discuss what is now. And before we discuss what is now, I argue that we have to decide on what is real. So let's talk about reality. So what is real? Uh, I have two hands, I have two arms, I have glasses on my face. Uh, we know uh, earlier in the morning somebody had a smoothie for breakfast, so on and so forth. Or do we? Do we know that for sure? Uh, I'm sure everybody's seen the movie Matrix. Uh, so you, you take the red pill, you take the green or the blue pill, so on and so forth. So reality is quite subjective. and. How is reality actually processed? So I tell you how. There's 86 billion neurons in the human brain. And there are 100 trillion connections through its synaptic connections. And that circuitry, there's somewhere in there uh, is a mechanism of self, perception, sense of reality, insight, and so on. 100 trillion connections. If you think about it, it's very hard to grasp. Uh, it's about a thousand times more than the amount of stars in the galaxy. So in that 100 trillion connections, we have reality. And what happens when that reality breaks? Something that we very seldom actually think about it. Something that we take for granted every single day. As we wake up, we perceive and react based on what we consider to be real. What happens when that breaks? I'll give you some examples of what happens when that breaks. This is a, a case of Susan. It's a creepy little bugger there. <laughs> That's not Susan, by the way. Um, so, Susan is a 33-year-old woman with unremarkable baseline medical history, which is a fancy way of saying generally healthy. Um, she has uh, two children and a husband, uh, and they're doing well financially. And everything was pretty normal until all of a sudden she started having headaches, low-grade fever, and, uh, for a couple of weeks. And all of a sudden, as if her reality has changed, uh, she started getting very violent. She started throwing chairs at the children um, and just acting very irrational. Um, the husband was wondering, well, okay, what the hell is going on? Did I do something wrong? It, it wasn't as simple as that. Um, and things progressed where she started having seizures. She started to see hallucinations, visual, and hearing them, and actually interacting with them. Uh, she's starting to see uh, the ceilings melt, tar rising from the ground, and um, she, at one point she had a delusion to a point where uh, she, she thought she needed to take individual tiles off the bathroom floor with her fingernails. And that was the only way for her to take off the tiles, like you do. Um, and the reason behind that was just as bizarre. She thought her children were trapped underneath. And as me having two hands and glasses on my face is real to me, this was incredibly real to her. In that 100 trillion connection, there was a circuit, there was a mechanism telling her and convincing her that that was real. So she did pull out the tiles, and uh, she also pulled out her fingernails uh, in the process. And she was also convinced that her teeth were invading her gums and needed to be taken out. So is this just a matter of psychosis? No, it turns out that she had what we call an uh, anti-N-methyl deaspartate receptor autoimmune encephalitis. I should say that 10 times faster. Uh, yeah. And um, it, it's a process where your body's natural process of um, uh, autoimmune system, uh, where, where you would actually attack 
a virus or an illness, what have you, starts to attack its own brain. Um, here's another example. Here's John. And John was a 55-year-old uh, gentleman who was an IT coordinator uh, going to work one day. And acutely, um, he T-boned two cars and still went to work. And his colleagues at work decided to call an ambulance because they knew something was wrong. This happened all of a sudden. And uh, uh, he was not able to move his left side of the body. And he was unaware that he could not move the left side of his body. And he was actually unaware of everything that is going on to the left side of his body. So this here is um, uh, some examples of what that means. That he was instructed to uh, circle specific, specific um, stars, and then, as you can see, they all cluster to the right. He's able to identify that cluster, but he's not, towards the midline and to the left. And um, uh, that's a copy, uh, to the left, uh, on A, that's a copy of his cube, three-dimensional cube, copy of a flower, and on the B, that's um, his attempt at drawing a clock uh, with all the numbers inside. As you can see, he's negating all the numbers on the left side. And D, that's called a line bisection test. Um, he was instructed to put a dash in the middle of the line. As you can see, it's skewing towards the right. And what happened with John? What happened to his reality? What happened to his left in reality? Um, he had hemi neglect to the left and then hemiparesis, which is a fancy way of saying neglect to the left and um, difficulty moving the left side of the body due to a right middle cerebral artery stroke. And that happened acutely. And that was an abrupt change for him. And his reality changed in a matter of seconds. And here's another uh, example. Uh, Gina is a uh, uh, six-year-old woman who was a nurse. And unlike the first two, she had insight. She knew her reality was changing. Her awareness of what she perceived visually and spatially was starting to change on her. Uh, she would be in the middle of the grocery aisle trying to find uh, peanut butter, and it would be literally three feet in front of her, and she's not able to grab it. And she would cry in the middle of the uh, grocery aisle because she's too embarrassed to acknowledge that to other folks in traffic. Uh, and uh, if she were to drive, this is a likely representation of what she would be seeing. So, needless to say, I told her not to drive. <laughs> um, some of the other things that happened with Gina, um, she, she uh, would constantly veer to the right when she's riding a bicycle because uh, she had no depth of perception. Well, rather inaccurate depth of perception in terms of uh, uh, where the sidewalk was, so on and so forth. And this progressed to get worse. And uh, she was diagnosed with posture cortical atrophy, which is a visual subtype of Alzheimer's, di uh, Alzheimer's disease, where Alzheimer's disease would happen in the interrenal cortex, which is here. Her progression started from the occipital lobe, which is the back of the head. And which is a visual processing center of the brain. And eventually, approximately two years after I, see, uh, I saw her in the clinic, uh, she was unaware of her impairments as well. So uh, why am I talking about these depressing stuff? Uh, in the context of self, in the context of change, it's important to know that Descartes, when he said, I think, therefore I am, he was rather inaccurate. But unfortunately, that phrase has been ingrained into the modern vocabulary that it's very hard to think of the body and the mind as one. We often talk about 
mind controlling the body or body controlling the mind, or better yet, uh, the mind influencing or uh, being connected with the body and vice versa. But that statement in itself actually supposes that there are two separate entities affecting each other. When you see the evidence, actually the evidence suggests that they're the same thing. Mind and body is the same thing. So in that, monism in neuroscience, uh, so, so when we talk about the uh, health and uh, the brain and the mind being fit, uh, we have a nice illustration there. Um, we're trying to propose that the self right now is in that 100 trillion connections. It is a physical state. And once that physical state no longer works, your reality changes. So is this another science talk? Is, it a, is this another brain talk? Yes, sort of. But the most important message uh, that I want to share with you today is, um, is this. If you've ever loved anybody, but never had the courage to tell them, tell them now. If you've ever been hurt and been upset, and you know you're going to forgive them six months from now, uh, 30 years from now, whatever it is, forgive them now. Because it's one thing to not be able to do so because they no longer are available to receive it. But it's a whole other thing if you cannot do it because you're no longer able to give love and forgiveness. So with that, thank you.